Hey guys, so today I wanted to discuss one of the hands, which I have answers already, but I had some questions in my head as well, so I wanted to make sure I was correct, and if I wasn't correct, to correct myself. So the hand goes as follows, William 17, Big Stand 5, heads up. Uh, we go ahead and check it back, which I think is, you know, standard on this sort of board. Uh, turn is a six of diamonds, big blind bets, 75% uh, pot, we call, and the river is a king of hearts, and he bets close to pot, and we're just gonna, and we just fold it. So, uh, our hero says that is a non multi table wreck, normally I just bet all my tags, but after an estimate lecture, I check here, some weak 10x uh, with Bedefida to protect my chicken range. Well, just like some weak 10x, yeah, I think the strategy is good. And the river I decided to fold because he has all the straights, two pairs, flushes, and I'm not sure how his probe turn and probe barrel is constructed bluff wise. My question is that merit just to click his turn bet or raise his 1.5 blind big blind turn bet to 3.5 so I have an easy fold if he jams and then face the give a decision so it's so is this bad style? Yeah, it's not bad. Uh so well, basically, I answered that you have a 10 and you have to call because on the river versus a pot bet, you have to call 50% of your range. And, uh, like, I would say, like, you have King X plus. So if you call all the straights, all the flushes, you know, like all two pairs on King X, it's like 30%, 35% of your range. So we need to find some additional, like, 15, 20% of combos. And 10X seem to be like the best ones to include and sort of the reason why you are checking back the 10 is so that you can call this river so that you do have a call in there. like protecting a range implies that you're gonna call this 10x twice because if you're just gonna call it on the river like 10x is no different from a 7x then there is no reason to check it back on the flop right so let's look at this spot a little bit deeper and see all sorts of exploits which we could make. So on the flop, we're going to be using a polarized bet. So we're going to be mostly using 1.5, uh, which again makes sense because a lot of draws on the board, it's a limp port. So here we're talking about 15 big blinds, not 17 big blinds. The strategies are going to be extremely similar. Just I had it calculated for 15 big blinds, most of the flops, so I decided to stick to 15. It's, it's not going to change much. Uh, because the river was not an over bet, the river was like a pot bet. Uh, okay, so we do indeed check back our weak tens, so that's well done. And uh, yeah, we're betting like our 7s 50 50 to protect our chicken back range. Hopefully, it makes sense. Uh, turning some ace highs into a bluff, especially with like ace jack, ace queen, ace nine, it's very hard to realize equity, and sometimes you could take it to show down and win. Uh, and regarding this, like just kind of standard, standard bluffing range, like you have all over the place. Uh, we have covered how we construct our bluffing range on the flop, like which hands we bet, which hands we check. So I'm not going to get into that today. But obviously, I'm just going to remind everybody that if you have like Jack 6, Jack 5 with a back to flash draw, it's uh, almost always a bet. Right, because uh, you have backdoors, and as a check, these hands play very poorly. And if you have backdoor flash draw of two cards, like King 9, for example, King 8 of clubs, King 6 of clubs, King Jack of clubs, you're always looking to check it back. And like Jack 6 of clubs, we're going to be checking back 50% of the time, while Jack 6 with like you know, as jack of diamonds or six of diamonds, we're almost never going to be checking back. So these are the things I want to remind. Uh, you guys, other than that, I think we have standard. So, turn is a six on diamonds, and big blind is supposed to have a very linear betting range because six of diamonds has helped us a lot because we're checking back nine eight, we're checking back eight five, we're checking back some flush draws. So, it is not a blank, it's not like a six of hearts on which big blind should have like a polarized betting range, a very wide betting range. Here, it is betting on very only like 30 percent of the time, and it bets. You know, like uh, only half pot. Uh, slow playing a lot of flushes and straights and two pairs. And you might say, well, that's not how people play, right? People are a lot more aggressive 
uh, on the turn. Like, they will never slow play a flush, or like, like almost never. They will never slow play a straight and stuff like this. And we will cover it as well, of course. Uh, like, we don't just follow GTO, of course, sometimes you want to play exploitatively. So, we will talk about this as well. But for now, let's just uh, think about how GTO is playing the sport, and later we'll think about how we could deviate from that. Uh, so, yeah, very linear bet. Uh, this is a check. Just going a little bit more polarized because we're in position. There is no need for us to be betting a seven ever, and we have very good realization on the river after betting because if we check, we're guaranteed to see showdown, and we're, if we're out of position, we check, we're not guaranteed to see showdown. Interesting thing about chicken back is we're almost always chicken back seven six and six point and four, and people usually don't check these hands even though it's a very standard check and a very good check because they are very concerned about how the bot looks like. The bot looks like very drawy, right? There are a lot of draws, which is true. But at the same time, most of the good draws, with a diamond in it especially, are going to be probing the turn. If your opponent's got like 8-3 with an 8 of diamonds, he's not going to check, he's going to bet. So actually... Your 7-6 doesn't require that much protection because there are not overcuts to it. And most of the draws, which have really good equity versus it, um, already like already bet on the turn themselves. So your 7-6 is very similar to, let's say the board was 10-7-4 and the turn is a king and you have a like king 3. So you have a hand which is like not that good. Like It's pretty good, right? But it's not like, it's not nowhere near like the nut level of good. Uh, and it doesn't require much protection, right? Because it's a kin. And the board is, there are some draws for sure. There are some guard shots, there are some open enders, but uh, it's not super drawy. Same here 7 4, 7 6, like 6 uh, 7 6, 6 4. These are the hands which I would always check back to protect my range because I'm not scared of overcuts. And he doesn't have that many draws in his checking, back, in his checking range. He has still some, of course, but. I'm kind of rooting the river to be something like a king of diamonds because he might be bluffing way too much on this river and I will have an easy call. Like, I want to induce bluffs from him rather than just bet the turn. So this is something I want to point out. Uh, but our opponent bet 1.5 big blinds uh, instead of betting one big blind. So let's just calculate, yeah. Let's just look at this calculation where he's betting 1.5. So this range is um, a little bit more polarized, so we don't bet as many to pairs. But yeah, let's let's look at GTO. It's 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 okay. It's not that, that big of a mistake. It's important also to point out that, to point out that GTO is not bluffing hands like Jack Five, Queen Five, Eight, Three, Eight, Deuce without a diamond because. We just have so many bluffs, man, here, right? 8-3 is an open-ender. 5 and a 9 will give it a straight, and the 6 of diamonds is not... It's a, it's, a, it's a card which helps small blind, but it's not a fantastic card for the small blind. So we need to be careful, but usually I think most people will be betting an open-ender uh, in this situation. So even though GTO is slow playing a lot on this turn, it's worth noting, but it's also not bluffing that much. There are a lot of head, head, hands which have a lot of equity, like open-enders, like check 5 or 3 which it's not bluffing. It's just like check folding them. So it's important to remember that. And in terms of calling, our calling range is very, very neat here. The easy way to remember it, if you have something which is weaker than a top pair, and you don't have additional draw, like you have no draw, you're folding it. So the hand as strong as Jack 7 is a fold versus 1.5 big blinds versus a bigger size. So, yeah, our calling range is quite neat here. And in these situations, you want to have some equity versus like two pair kind of hand versus a straight kind of hand. So Jack 7 is dead versus a flush versus a straight versus most versus a lot of two pairs, like has very limited equity. So we would prefer to call a hand like 6-5, obviously, or queen-4 with the queen of diamonds rather than jack-7. Okay. So we call, and the river is a king. Uh, actually, before we look at the river, because uh, the hero said here that 
Big Blind has all the straights, all the flushes, all the two pairs, right? He's got a lot of strong hands, which is true. But let's look actually how many of the strong hands he has. So he's got 4% of his range are flushes. 4%. 5% are straights, so like 9-10% of his range overall are going to be straights and flushes. And he checked 100% on the flop, so it's going to be very similar to actually like, um, if big blind's range is somewhat reasonable pre-flop, this is what he's going to have on this turn, because if he didn't have a donkey range in the flop, which most people don't. He's got 5% of two pairs, and 10% of top pairs, but I don't think a 10 would pot bet the river here. So the hands which we are concerned with are flushes, straights, and two pairs. And it's only 14%. 14% of his range, so even less than one-fifth of his range, are going to be these hands. Implying that he's betting all of them. And of course, if he's betting all of them, it's going to mean that whenever he's checking this turn, we're just going to bet everything. We're just going to turn ace-jack into a bluff every time. Just going to turn everything into a bluff. We're going to pot bet queen seven for value. Because if he's betting that aggressively with his draws, he literally has nothing when he checks this turn. He only has like seven, and seven sixes, and fours. And like some shitty hands. So if you're thinking that he's betting, even if you think he's, he's betting all of them, it's only 15%. And if he's doing, uh, if he's bluffing all 15%, it means if you are going to fall 10 5 on the river versus a check on the turn, you have to go crazy. You have to just be super aggressive. So just, just something to keep in mind. And uh, that he's got 20% of his range of combo draws, 20%, that's a lot. 10% uh, of flash draws, 20% are open enders, 16% of gut shots, a lot of draws. Not that much value, but a lot of draws. Again, we have to keep that in mind. So, we, uh, we called him, and the river is a king. So, on this river, he's got basically three sizes. Block bet, pot bet, and over bet jam. Uh, he wants to be block bet in his tens, obviously. The 9, the 8, jack 10, he's not going to pot bet them. Uh, king kind of helped us a little bit because we've got hands like king queen is basically king of diamonds or a queen of diamonds uh, something like that um so it did help us somewhat king seven was a king of diamonds so pot and ten is definitely an overplay because we're just folding jack seven on the turn already so what ten is hoping to get value from uh, then two pairs and some straights could go for a pot and like flushes just gonna over by jam and straights now, before we think about this, before we construct our calling range, like I said, we need to know what is the frequency we should be calling with versus a pot bet to make his bluffs indifferent because he's got a lot of bluffs. Look at how many bluffs he has. So right now he's bluffing only 33% of all of his bluffs. So if he's got like 9.5, 9.3, quite often he's going to be giving up. Jack 5, he gives up a lot. Jack 9, Jack 8, he gives up pretty much every time. So he definitely has a lot of bluffs. And whenever your opponent has a lot of bluffs, which he could potentially, you know, bet with, you need to construct, you need to think about your calling range. There are some spots where he doesn't have a lot of bluffs or the spot which is very rare. And you can just play off his range. You can, like, well, his range just mostly has value, so I'm just going to fold everything. But... In the spot where he has a lot of bluffs, so he needs to be given up with a lot of his bluffs. You need to be constructing a good calling range. You need to make sure that you're not folding way too much. Because it's going to be very easy to exploit. Uh, like, it's going to be very easy for him to exploit you. Unless you got some secrets. But, like, they have to be really sick to be folding, uh, like, 10x here. So let's think about it. Uh, now, how our range looks like. So we've got 10% of flush and straights and 9% of two pairs, so 20% are going to be two pair plus, and only 8% of top pairs. I honestly thought it's going to be more than that. I thought it's going to be more like 13% of top pairs. So I said it's between 30 and 35% our range is top pair plus. The reality is that it's only like 27, 26. 
So like by 5% less than what I thought, even more than that. So if we're calling only kins, we're calling 25, like 26% of the time. We need to be calling 50, right? Now we have only 10% of 10s. So even if we're going all the 10s, it means we're calling 35% of the time, 37. It's still not enough. We need to be calling sevens as well. So the GTO calling range here looks like this, right? So we're calling like all the tens, of course, and we're calling uh, like basically half of our sevens, more like 75% of our sevens on the false nines and eights. And we're folding yeah, 50% of the time. Important thing to note here also that we're folding some kins, quite a bit of kins actually, but we're always calling a 10. Uh, from the blocker standpoint, uh, it's very relevant because 10 is a much better blocker than a kin. Because 10 blocks him having 10, 7, 10, 4, 10, 6. And kin doesn't block any two pairs. Because big blind is never going to probe 10, kin 7 or kin 6 for 1.5 big blinds. So kin is actually very irrelevant. The only reason why we're calling some kins is that, no, I mean, it's still like a good hand, of course, but even seven could be better than a kin, like eight, seven, for example. Like it's making, it's a break even call, but if you take uh, kin three, you will see that kin three is a box hand to call compared to eight, seven, because again, seven blocks, seven, four, seven, six, ten, seven kind of hands. Kin three doesn't. Kin 3 is just like a random love catching. So that's something to think about as well. Even though we are folding some kins, we are never folding a 10 pretty much, because it's like the top love catch which we have, and we are calling 7s very, very often. And in general, again, if you are thinking about folding a 10 on this blank of a river, it's very, very blank, it defeats the purpose of checking it back. Because the point of checking it back is that you can call this river. You're hoping that he will bluff often enough that he will put pressure on you. And if he puts a lot of pressure on you, you need to protect your range. Protecting your range implies that you're calling your hand twice on most runouts. Right? If you're folding it on this river, it means you need to bet it on the flop. Checking it back and folding on the river is the worst thing you can do. Because you're missing value and you're not protecting your range. It's very important to understand how uh, the, con the construction of your range works here. Uh, okay. So that's it. Like, like that's about the GTO spot. But you can argue, okay, well, yeah, sure. Then we, we need to be calling a lot here. And if I were, like, I would probably be a lot more tight here, like, not a lot more tight, but probably I would be tight here. I would definitely be folding a 4, for example. I would never call 9, 4, 8, 4, 5, 4 kind of hands. But I'm just going to be folding my 4s, probably, if I don't have, like, I'm going to call it a 6. And I'm probably folding, like, uh, kind of like 7, 5, right? 9, 7, 8, 7, probably not, but, like, win 7, jack 7, hands like this. So... I'm calling all the top pairs, I'm calling all the tens, and I'm calling like a7, a6, like 9, 7, 8, 7 kind of hands. So I'm still overfolding quite a bit. I'm overfolding by like 7, 8%. It's, it's a lot, actually. Uh, but at least I'm calling the necessary frequency to not be overfolding by a lot, right? So at least I'm doing that. Look at if if I suspect that my opponent is maybe maybe he bets bigger on the turn with a stronger hand, so maybe his range a li little bit too strong. So I'm overfolding, but I don't think overfolding by like thirty percent when your opponent has that many bluffs, which he could potentially bluff versus you, is a good idea. Okay, now let's look at this part exploitatively. Now, what if we say that, okay, let's assume that our big blind bets, 75% uh, of all, all of his blushes. That's a lot. 75% of all of his trades. 75% of all of his two pairs. I mean, tens are kind of irrelevant because he's never going to pot bet with a 10 on the river anyway, right? So it's not much. 
And in terms of air, he's betting all of his combo draws, which I think 8 3, like 5 2 with a diamond, everybody's gonna bet. He's betting like flush draws, whatever. Queen, diamonds, jack diamonds, he's betting. I think it's fair. And here he's betting like his 8x, 9-5, jack 5, so most of his open enders. With god shots, he's usually given up except for jack 9 because it's like not gotta. With an overcut. And he doesn't bluff anything else. So that's quite a fair assumption. You can say that maybe jack 5, queen 5 gets checked. Maybe. Yeah, sure. It's not going to change that much. I think most people, when they have an open ender and you check it back with flop, are going to be bluffing it. But, yeah, well, sure, maybe not. But this is an assumption where Big Blind is betting close to all of his nuts. Like he's, he's really like bluff, bluff value betting a lot. So the first thing which we do when he checks, we're very, very aggressive. Let's compare it to GTO frequency. Here we're checking back 61% and our size is 1.5. Here we're checking back 50% and our size is pot. We're pot betting 35% of the time. Here we were potting only 6. So basically you can pot bet pocket 8s on the turn. Or you could pot bet like 9-7, queen 7. If you think that he's doing it on the river, you have to do something about the turn as well. You can't just... I'm just going to fold the river a lot, but I'm not going to value but super thin versus his checking range on the turn. So, the, like, these things go in hand in hand. Um, now, he bets. He chose to call. Uh, calling roughly the same range, we're just going to be calling a little bit looser. 36% fold. Now, it's 41 here because uh, he has a little bit way too many bluffs, but I'm fine taking out some bluffs here. It's not going to change that much. So on the river, again, the hands, which is going to value bet, are going to be 10% of straights, 12% of two pairs, and 8% of flushes. So 30% of his range are going to be nuts, right? Like this, this are nutted combos, okay? So 30%. And he bets pot. So we need 15% of air for him to be betting to make it a good call. He has 56% of air. So a quarter of, the, of his bluffs will be good enough for us to call. Quarter is a very, like, it's a very small number. So, like, yeah, of course a 10 is going to be a call in this situation, I think. And just... I think people, whenever there is an overcard and they know you have a capped range, they know that you have a lot of like Queen X of Diamonds, Jack X of Diamonds, hands like this. Uh, they, I think they're very likely to follow through. At least one time out of four, very, very likely to follow through. And the problem which I have with your approach that you assume, like you, you say, I don't know his bluffing frequencies. So I'm just going to fold everything. Like, if I don't know his bluffing frequencies, maybe I'm a little bit conservative, so I'm just going to call every king, every ten, pretty much every seven, um, yeah, and, and fold everything else. So I'm just going to often fold by 5%, maybe, because I'm a little bit too conservative, of course. But I'm just going to call, like, a frequency which is good, which doesn't let me... Let him exploit me way too much, and I get some information. I see what he's doing. Maybe if I see him betting 1.5 on this turn and then betting like half pot, and I'm like, well, maybe when he bets bigger, his range is stronger. So maybe I should be overfolding versus this size. Sure. But if I have never seen it, or if I've only seen it once or twice, I'm not going to be doing that extreme of an adjustment. I don't think it's fair. And also, if you're doing these adjustments, you have to do them all over the place. You can't just be focusing on one spot. Okay. Uh, also, as a big blind, let, let's think about it as a big blind a little bit. Uh, I think, first of all, this is a very good spot to bluff on the river, since people have a lot of missed hands to call. Uh, they have a lot of hands like 6, 5, 8, 7. 
which some of them ha find very hard to call, especially versus like an over bet. This is a big bet. So I would recommend be over bluffing here probably. So I would personally be betting Jack Five on the turn every time. And on the king, I'm very often would like over bet slightly, maybe bet like six big blinds, just make a small over bet to make sure he falls 9787, stuff like that. Because if he calls me with every 10, every king, and like everything else, it's nearly not enough. Like, let's just see it. So let's say our opponent is calling us with the second pair plus. So he needs to be folding 50% of the time. If he calls me with every second pair plus, he's folding 59. So I'm just printing money, man, here. I'm, I'm like, so that's a lot. And you are folding even more than that. Just, just think about it. Like, if you just fold this, I can bluff a random two bananas versus you. I don't need to even to have a hand. I just can have two napkins, and be okay. Overfolding more than this is for sure a mistake, because it's just way too good of a bluff. I, I, I don't assume people fold a ten here, but even if with this assumption. Which is like seems to be conservative given that what you folded, it's still uh, a very profitable bluff. So I would recommend take this line a lot as a bluff. And uh, yeah, both on the turn and on the river. So I think it's a good spot because people don't play off their range. And it kind of shows the importance of understanding that, like, if you know how your range looks like, even if you don't know the GTO strategy, the correct GTO strategy, it gives you an advantage. Because you know how often you need to call, you know how much full deck you need to have in order to make it like a good bluff, a good call, and whatever. And sometimes when you don't have any information, you have to play the numbers. You have to be like, okay, I have to call this, like the certain hands, because I don't know what he's doing, and I don't want to be making a big mistake, so I'm just going to be defending close to perfect frequency and when i see that maybe some more information maybe i get something else i can you know, make a good adjustment but just assume randomly is not good okay hopefully it was helpful